asking you to minister to us, it's kind of my son come to me earlier and he says, Dad, what's, what's going on? And I think it's, it's um, fun and yet it's somewhat frightening to know that the presence of God is in our midst and we're excited about that but there's a nervousness about what he might do because we walk in the unknown and so we got God here moving amongst us speaking to people and we're a little nervous about what all he's wanting to do and I think that's a that's probably a good nervousness it's a good reverence and and I want to encourage you to stay there that I don't believe the Lord is finished and we're just going to continue allowing him to move in our midst. I'm going to ask Jan to come now. She has something. Could we have this microphone for Jan? You want to speak into my tie? I don't know that I like this. Um, it's been... Um, my heart's desire for about a year to be able to speak in tongues. And when he's talking about the unknown and scary, as much as it was scary, I wanted it so bad. But I wanted to check myself that it was for the right reason. It wasn't so that the person that was beside me speaking in tongues could hear that I was holy too. <laughs> and uh, so I think uh, that's why the Lord took a year. <laughs> And um, this last week, well, actually, the night of the presbytery, there was a, um, a phrase that came to my mind. And I was so scared of making up something because I wanted it so bad that I was just going to go, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and that was going to be it. <laughs> and so I said, no, I'm not going to open my mouth. And it went away. And this last week, it came back. Um, Wednesday night, I had the privilege of being out here with the kids. And if nobody's seen what Barney Joe does with those kids, they've missed a real mission. And she's teaching the kids that if they can pray in the spirit to do so. And she said, whenever anyone's praying, pray in the spirit. Agree with them. And I'm like, all these kids are like, okay, yeah, they've heard this before. And I've probably heard it before, too. But I obeyed her, and I obeyed God. And here I am with a bunch of kids, and we're praying for Saudi Arabia. And I just opened up my mouth, and it came. And that was Wednesday night. Thursday night, I had choir practice with some of the ladies. And I went up to Barb Bennett. And I said, what was it like when you started speaking in tongues? Was it really scary? Did it sound right? Was it real long or was it just this one short phrase? You know, I was just full of questions and she was so excited for me that, and she, you know, she just helped me confirm that this was not something I'd made up. I couldn't shake this phrase. I, I know I've never heard it before. You know, the things that, um, a Baptist background girl is is so unfamiliar with and, and uh, it's it's scary and so she can help you know help me confirm if you think it is use it so I've been using it solid for <laughs> Thursday Friday Saturday and Sunday <laughs> and it's it's the greatest thing um, it's I know in my heart that it's powerful I've been told that it's powerful but it's not if you say it in your mind. Um, I was talking to Brigitte about it, and I, she said, well, how are you using it? And I said, well, I'm thinking about it in my mind all the time. And she said, no, that doesn't work. <sighs> so she said, no, you have to say it with your mouth. And I said, well, I'm not even sure I'm saying it right. <laughs> and that's okay, you just say it. 
so I'm just, I keep saying it and saying it. You know, and my mom, she still goes to the Baptist church. I even went and told her yesterday that I have this phrase that I really think is my prayer language. And she really received it. First of all, she said, what's it mean? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, but I know it edifies the Lord and that he wants me to use it and he wants me to say it. And so I'm a charismatic now. <laughs> <laughs> And see, when you, uh, when you receive the Holy Spirit like that, you're just so much more intelligent. <laughs> you, you really are because uh, she, she goes to her mother and, and she says that I've got this prayer language, I've got this little phrase and I'm excited about it. And her mother says, well, what does it mean? And she says, I don't know. Now there's a sure sign that the Holy Spirit is making her more intelligent than she was prior to the infilling. Now, I, I'm serious about that. She tells her mother, I don't know. And the Bible says, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands. She said, I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't know what it is. Now that's, that's the intelligence the Holy Spirit brings to you. That you don't know a whole lot. She answered the question properly. Without maybe even realizing it. What does it mean? I don't know. I just don't know. The Bible says you don't know, you just speak mysteries unto God, and that's it. And that's good enough, isn't it? Now, is there any significance to what's going on here? Are these just coincidences that just seem to happen today? Aren't you glad you showed up today? I thank God Billy Graham wasn't in town this weekend. <laughs> but I believe that, uh, I believe God's here. I really do. And I don't think these things are just happening for no reason. I think as we go on in reverence of what I'm going to say and what you've already heard, you will probably become even more fearful. A godly fear. What is God trying to do? Why did Tim come today? Why did Jan get her prayer language this week? Why am I going to speak this message this day? Why are you here? Is God wanting to do something with you? And this is just not a Sunday for our attendance chart. Amen? So I'm trying to get across to you that we're on our way but we're still going so stay tuned in stay tuned in if you don't have a Bible this morning I would like for you to raise your hand so the ushers can bring you a Bible or you can get close to someone who has one because we're going to be reading several passages this morning and be advantageous to you to have a Bible. So if you just raise your hands, I know sometimes we run off and we forget them.
we serve a good God, a great God. Here we go. Fasten your seatbelt. First, I'm just going to read you some scriptures. You won't have to turn to them. It says in Luke, chapter 8, verse 18, it says, Take heed, therefore, how you hear. We read in Isaiah that the Lord said, For if you have an ear, listen. Now everybody can hear, everybody has two ears, but Jesus said, take heed how you hear. There's a way to hear things. You can hear them with your carnal mind, or you can hear them by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 3.1 says, Brother, I, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. He said, I couldn't even talk to you like spiritual people because you're so carnal, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying. What Paul is saying is, sometimes, if we don't hear pro properly, we can use or promote spiritual truths to satisfy our own carnal desires. We can hear spiritual truths and use them to promote our own carnal desires. Let me give you a couple examples. This is Mark 11, 24. It says, Therefore I tell you whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Just ask anything you want. And whatever you ask for, believe that you're going to get it, and God will give it to you. And sometimes, instead of producing an attitude of a caring father that has the welfare of his children in mind, people can take this scripture and it produce greed and materialism and carnality. Trying to turn God, the creator, into a cosmic bellhop that every time they ring the bell, he has to run and answer their very whims. People use the scripture and they produce, instead of the God of creation, they produce a God that they've created, producing a God that's more interested in their happiness and their self-image than his plan and purpose throughout eternity. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works that no one, so that no one can boast. I listened to Brian on the tape from last week, and he really did a fantastic job. I really enjoyed what he said. And he made this comment. Now I realize I'm taking this comment out of the context of what he was speaking. And he said, we have been hearing a lot about grace. When I heard that, I thought to myself, have we been talking a lot about grace? Or have we been hearing a lot about grace? Take heed how you hear. There's been a lot of talk about grace, but have you really heard it? If you've heard grace, and instead of producing an attitude of a father who loves and whose mercy endures forever, and it produced an excuse to pacify your flesh, you didn't hear grace. There may have been a lot of talk about it, but you didn't hear it. Let me give you an example that we can all understand. If a man commits adultery, 
and he sees the error of his way and he comes to his wife in humility and he asks her to forgive him for his sin and her in godly compassion says I forgive you I love you and no matter what you do I'll always love you and I'll always care about you no matter how you hurt me I'll always forgive you If that man gets up off of his knees and comes up with the conclusion now this is not a bad deal you mean to tell me I can go out and do whatever I want to do and you're gonna forgive me that man did not understand grace when he heard say whatever you do I'll forgive you and it produced an attitude of pacifying the flesh you didn't hear grace you hear things like that you get up off your knees and say what an awesome woman you are I don't deserve what you've just bestowed upon me I don't deserve the forgiveness and kindness that you've granted to me and it's brought me under conviction that I never want to hurt the people who love me or hurt the person who loves me again and I'll never make this mistake that's what grace produces when Jesus says I'll always love you I'll always forgive you and I'll always throughout eternity extend my mercy to you and it produces in us oh you mean I can go out there now and do everything I ever wanted to do you mean some of those things I gave up I can now go do and still be a Christian if that's what you heard you didn't hear grace what it is is when you do do those things he will grant you forgiveness because of the awesomeness of his love but what it ought to produce in you is a sincere desire to be holy and not hurt the one who loves you so greatly. This is grace. Shall I sin that grace abound? God forbid. That's not why I want grace so I can run around and do what I want. I understand the awesomeness of grace the unconditional love and forgiveness of a great God that's what it's to produce and if you hear improperly you can hear it to pacify the lust of your own flesh and what I'm going to talk about today I want you to hear properly I want to talk about the Holy Spirit and I don't want you to hear it as an opportunity for you to just want this power. But I want you to hear it where it produces a hunger. It produces a cry in our heart for our need for God Almighty. John 14, you can turn there. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you Psalms 51. A lot of scripture reading today. You can stay in John 14. I'm going to go to Psalms. I'm going to try to go rather quickly because I feel the Lord wants to minister to us at the end. Psalms 51 says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness and according to the greatness of thy compassion. Blot out my sins. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. 
For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done what is evil in thy sight. So that thou art justified when thou dost speak and blameless when thou dost judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, thou dost desire the truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part, thou will make in the inner part thou will make known wisdom. Now this is David's prayer after he had been with Bathsheba. He said, purify me with a hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which thou hast broken rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Now listen to this. David says, create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from thy presence. Now hear this. And do not take the Holy Spirit from me. Please, God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The anointing of the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit abides and dwells in the New Testament believer. But David understood the power and the significance of the Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways. And sinners will be converted to thee. Samson, the Bible says, woke up in the presence of his enemies. And he didn't realize that the Holy Spirit had left him. John 14 verse 15 says... If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep them. If you don't, you won't. I was in Florida. The pastor there was asking me, he says, I've got this dilemma in my church. He says, I'd like to like you to tell me what I uh, should do about it. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, I got this couple in my church, an older man, his late 40s. <laughs> See, I'm 44, so you're not old till you're in your late 40s. And he says, uh, and this younger lady about 24, they're in love and uh, he said they really love God both of them just they just really love God my problem is they're just living together and they're not married and before he could you know how they do just, just when he got that sentence out of his mouth I said but, but, but they love God they really love God I thought about this. They really love God? Keep my commandments. They're not keeping the commandments. Can't justify what they're doing. I said, yeah, I think you ought to go to them. Talk to them. We just can't run around breaking the commandments of God and saying we love God. Living the commandments is the fruit of us loving God. Now let me go on here. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Verse 25. 
These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. John 16, verse 5. Jesus speaking said, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, Where are you going? But because I said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16, verse 13 and 14 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take a mine and shall disclose it to you. In other words, the Holy Spirit going to parrot what Jesus is saying. Jude 20. Jude 20. Right before the book of Revelation. Says, but you, beloved... Building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Verse 25 says, Therefore laying aside falsehood, speaking truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we're all members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity let him who steals, steal no more, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may be, bring grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption." Ephesians 5, verse 17 says, So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, you have to ask yourself the question when Paul says, Be filled with the Spirit. Was he writing to Christians? Is the book of Ephesians written to heathen or to Christians? And he said the will of the Lord is to be filled with the Spirit. All these passages, some strained language in it. He says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit... One of the passages said that you will not be an orphan. It says, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit so you're, you're not going to be an orphan. 
Well, the word orphan means a person or persons without protection. He said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm not going to leave you without protection. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to protect you. We worry so much about failing out in this big bad world. We worry so much about the corruption and influence of the world for ourselves and our children. But the Bible says that he's not left us orphans. He's gave us the Holy Spirit to protect us from the things of the world. I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send something. The Holy Spirit. And he's going to comfort you. He's going to bring all things to remembrance. Now this is humorous, but that passage is more valuable to those over 40 than those under. The Holy Spirit needs to help people who are over 40 to bring things to remembrance. Sometimes they can't remember your name. He says he's going to comfort, he's going to bring to remembrance, he's going to guide you on into all truth. He's not going to guide you into any kind of weirdness. He's not going to guide you into some kind of lie. He's not going to make a fool out of you. He's going to guide you into all truth. Jude said that if you pray with the Holy Spirit, it's going to build your faith. How many need more faith? says in John that he'll convict you of sin. And Ephesians said it's God's will that you be full of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. All these passages, if you just read them and you think about them, would you say that the Holy Spirit should play a significant part in a Christian's life? Do you think he ought to have something to do with what we do on a daily basis? You think that we ought to be dependent upon him? Should he be playing a significant role in the church? Could it be possible? Could it be possible that as we, the people of God, in our sincere desire to build the church, serve one another, Love God. Have neglected the help of the Holy Spirit? Is it possible to neglect the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Acts 1. First account, verse 1, I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach till the day was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proof appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God and gathering them together he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait for what the Father promised, which he said, you heard from me, for John the Baptist baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not, not many days from now. And so when they'd come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it, is it at this time you restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know these times which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, Samaria, and even the remotest part of the earth. Now let me ask you a question. Would you be impressed if you met somebody raised from the dead? Would that impress you? Would you like to bury one of your family members and kind of be home that night thinking about it? Talking to your husband and wife and say, boy, we're going to miss old John. He was a good old boy. And all of a sudden, John walked through the door and said, hi. You think that impressed you? You think that would have an effect on you? The Bible says that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. He walked the face of the earth for 40 days. 
and 40 nights, and it said over 500 people saw it. Said he taught them about the kingdom for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you think it would be fairly significant to be taught by the greatest teacher that's ever lived? I mean, there's good teachers, and then there's Jesus. Do you think that would be kind of exciting to be taught by the perfect one for 40 days? Do you think that would affect your life if Jesus taught you about the kingdom for 40 days? Here you're talking to somebody that's been raised from the dead. They're perfect. They're the greatest teacher on the face of the earth. And then the greatest teacher on the face of the earth that's been raised from the dead says, You know, you can listen to me and you can see me, but I'm telling you, it's not enough. It's not going to get you by in life. Don't you think if you saw Jesus alive from the dead and he taught you that could sustain you through life? Jesus said it's not enough. He said I want you to stay in Jerusalem till you receive power from on high. I want to send to you the Holy Spirit. And he said don't you leave Jerusalem till you get it. It's kind of like the American Express travel checks. Don't leave home without them. Of all the power that they'd seen, Jesus said, don't, don't, don't leave without it. In Acts chapter, well, still in chapter 1, Peter said, at this time, he stood up in the midst of the brethren, gathered there about 125 persons were there together. Now, this is an interesting passage. If 500 people seen Jesus... How comes only 120 were at the prayer meeting? Don't you think you would have been there if you saw him? But there, here we got. 380 people still didn't show up. So don't be depressed when people don't come to prayer meetings. Some people won't even come if they've seen Jesus resurrected from the dead. It says, brethren, the scripture had to be filled which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Jesus, Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for it's counted among them, and he received his portion in the ministry. Now this man acquired with a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. It's pretty rough, isn't it? Probably make a good movie. Judas 3. And it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language the field was called whatever, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate and let no man dwell it in his office, let another man take. It is there, therefore necessary that the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until it is taken up from us, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they put forth two men, Joseph, Bersabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, who knowest the hearts of all men, show which one of these two thou hast chosen to occupy this ministry that the apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Now, does this sound like church or does this sound like church? Same people at Pentecost in this upper room. And that sounds like church to me. Here they have a meeting. And in this meeting they decide they need leadership. They not only decide they need leadership, they have a vote. And out of the vote they come up with a leader. Now think about that. Here's this 120 people. They're up in this room. They're praying. They're praising. They see that the body has needs. They say, we need some leadership over this thing. Let's find a leader to replace Judas. That's what churches do, don't they? They come together and they pray and they sing a little. And they decide who the leaders are going to be. 
and yet they still didn't have the Holy Spirit. You can do a lot of things that are good, wonderful, and necessary without the Holy Spirit. You can even pray and praise. You can even select leaders. But it wasn't until Acts the second chapter verses 1 through 4 that the Holy Spirit come as a wind and fiery tongues on their heads and filled them full of the Spirit. They did all these things before they even got the Spirit. Those things frighten me. You can do a lot of religious things, a lot of good things that you should do and still have need of the Holy Spirit. Now look at this in Acts 4. Acts 4, verse 23. I realize I'm reading a lot of scripture. I'm going to get you to read the Bible through one way or another. It says, and when they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voice to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is thou who didst make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, thy servant, did say, Why did the Gentiles rage? And the people devised futile things, and the kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst appoint, but Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever thy hand had purposed and predestined to occur. And now, Lord, take note of their threats, and grant that thy bondservants may speak thy word with all confidence. When well, thou dost extend thy hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of the Holy Servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Question. This is when Peter was released from jail, and he... I'm assuming he came to some of the people that were holding a prayer meeting or at least gathered together that were in the upper room. Some of the people who he had previously been with and he makes this statement about hearing their threats and all this and these Christians that were gathered together, it says that the Holy Spirit came where they were at and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I thought they had the Holy Spirit. I heard one man say, sometimes there's, there's one baptism, many fillings, because we all leak. <laughs> now, I don't know if that fits into your thought, theology, but it sounds good. And it said when they were filled, they preached the word with boldness. You can run around church all you want and say that we are protected by the First Amendment to have the freedom of religion, but I haven't seen that amendment give a whole lot of people boldness to preach the gospel. You can say we have the freedom and the right to worship any way we like. This is America. But I haven't seen that right give anybody the boldness to preach the gospel. It takes the Holy Spirit to give us boldness to speak the word. Look in verse 32. After they were filled with the Spirit, it says, The congregation of those who believed were one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. You can teach people all day long. They can't serve God and mammon. You can tell them you can't serve God in money. You can warn them and encourage them not to get trapped in materialism. You can tell people not to be selfish and materialistic. But it won't happen if the Holy Spirit don't move. They'll keep what they got. It was the Holy Spirit after it came upon them they came to a conclusion. To give of what they have. To make things come. You ever wonder why you can't get any money in the offerings? You ever wonder why you can't get any tithe? 
You ever wonder why it takes six or seven months to come up with a thousand bucks to buy a copy? You ever wonder? Could it be that we need the Holy Spirit to move on us? And when the Holy Spirit moves, no matter how much you preach against materialism, no matter how much you preach against, you can't serve God and mammon. Unless the Holy Spirit moves, nothing happens. The Bible says he's like the wind. You don't know where he comes from, you don't know where he goes, but you can always tell when he's been there. You can always tell whether the Holy Spirit is moving in the church or whether it's moving in people's lives. You may not see him come in the door. You may not see him moving in us, moving amongst us. But you can tell when he's here. You could tell he was here this morning. By just the things people were doing, things people were saying. Acts 10 talks about Peter going to Cornelius' house. Preached the gospel to Cornelius in chapter 10. And when he's seen the Holy Spirit fall on them and they begin to speak with other tongues, Peter said, now I understand you're the Lord of all nations. You're just not the God of the Jews. You're the God of all nations. You're just not a Baptist. Captain man-made religions. Traditions. But unless the Holy Spirit moves, we'll be just like Peter. He didn't even think he should go in a Gentile's house. He didn't even think he should associate with them. He had to see the Holy Spirit move before he believed it. People are coming into our church. They're confused. And they're disoriented. They're wanting answers to their problems. Let me read you a passage out of 1 Thessalonians. You might want to turn to this one. It'll help you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 5. It says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. He said, our gospel did just not come to you in word only, but it come in power. It came in the Holy Spirit. It came with full conviction. People are coming into our churches and they're wanting answers to their problems. You can just give them answers. If a guy's a liar, you tell him the Bible says lie no more. We read that earlier in Ephesians. The guy's stealing, you tell him not to steal anymore. But if it's just words, they keep on lying and they keep on stealing. People come who have been hurt. They come abused. They come from dysfunctional families. Real buzzword nowadays. Everybody comes from a dysfunctional family if you're interested in that. Everybody was born in sin. That's fairly dysfunctional. Father Adam got us all into a dysfunctional family. Some have been hurt and abused and had these things happen in their life where the pain is so unbearable that they're even contemplating suicide. They hurt so bad, doesn't seem to be any answers. They're depressed. They start thinking about suicide as being the only way out. They come and It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Some of the problems in the church. Lady comes to you and she says, 
I'm destroyed. I committed fornication. And the guilt has eaten me alive. You tell her that. She needs to ask God to forgive her. Let him cleanse her. Help her get back on the right track. She does it. A month later, she's back in your office saying, tears running down her face and now I'm pregnant. Big problems. Difficult times. All these people are hurting. And I read the Bible, it says the Holy Spirit is the comforter. The Holy Spirit is the helper. The Holy Spirit guides into all truth. Church, we need a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. You can preach and teach them all the truth you want to. You can tell them what they should do and shouldn't do. You can even tell them what to help them. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't move, it's just words. Biblical words. Tell people all the time that they shouldn't sin. But it's the Holy Spirit that convicts the sin. Sometimes I think, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. The Lord started giving me this message when I was on the plane. I think to occupy my mind so I wouldn't be frightened of the plane. Bless God. And I got to thinking that sometimes we can educate ourselves right out of the power of the Spirit. We're so stinking smart with our counsel and our advice and knowing the Bible. That we're just giving people words all the time and the Holy Spirit's not moving. We've educated ourselves right out of the power of God. Now counseling and advice and all those things are good and they're wonderful and they should be done. But I'm telling you, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move upon us, we're in big trouble. Apostle Paul said this. I like what Jan said this morning, just tickled me. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than y'all. He said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. He said, ye all, because he was from the south. He said, I spoke in tongues, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Is that because he goes to pre-service prayer and three minutes after he starts praying, he runs out of things to say and he wants to fill up the 20 minutes so he just speaks in, tw in tongues for the other 17? He just wants to kind of fill in time so he just speaks in tongues a lot? Or did he actually think that when he spoke in tongues, something happened? Something happened in the heavenlies and something happened to him. I've got a word of God for people who are depressed. You ever been depressed? How many's ever been depressed? How many ever had a blue Monday? How many's ever been a little down? Had a bad day. Things just aren't going right. So you're just a little depressed. Arms are going chop, chop, to answer to all of them. I've had all those. Well, I've got, I've got a word of God for you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it says, a man who speaks in other tongues speaks unto God. There's mysteries that he doesn't understand. But in doing it, he edifies himself. You want to get cheered up? You want to come out of your depression? You want to get out of your blue Monday? Paul says a man who speaks in tongues is edifies himself. How many need edify? Right after you have a fight with the wife, how many need edify? Just when the kids are a little rebellious, who needs edify? Just when the boss tells you a jerk and you aren't doing your job, who needs edify? Soon as somebody tells you, boy, you watch that TV and the cartoons they got on and all this stuff coming on, this rock and roll music and all this stuff, you listen to all that stuff and sometimes I can think we don't stand a chance. There's so much wickedness out there, we're out to be overtaken any moment. And I get depressed. I think all the kids are going to end up in hell, the church is going to fall apart, and I'm going to backslide. 
And I think, man, I just better pray in tongues and get edified here. I'm down. I get around some people and I just get down just listening to them talk about all the misery in the world today. And I'm not saying there isn't misery out there. Because there is. You come off of a high. You shared Christ to somebody at work. And you come home and your wife gets on your case because you haven't picked garbage out for four days. And your high goes to a low. You need to just pray in tongues and edify yourself. Now, I'm not trying to be silly. I think people who are struggling in depression, I mean real depression, that has a grip on their life and is driving them back into the memories of their past and remembering all the hurt and anguish that was put upon them, that was out of their control, until the devil just drives them into depression. They need to pray in tongues so they can be edified. The Bible says if you do it, you'll edify yourself. I've got a sneaky suspicion it's better than all the knowledge you can gain about reading. Feel it coming? Start praying. I don't think these things are in the Bible for nothing. Sounds like a, a real help. people in pain they need to be comforted it's one thing for you to put your arm around them and comfort them it's another thing for the Holy Spirit to comfort them now hear me I believe the Holy Spirit can comfort them through you I believe we need to, the Holy Spirit to come and convict people of sin you can tell them they're living in sin all the time. Unless the Holy Spirit comes and convicts them of sin, they won't change. Now, the Holy Spirit can use you to convict them of sin. The problem is, too many people try to be the Holy Spirit instead of being led by the Holy Spirit. My wife used to tell me all the time, I started getting on her case, she said, don't be the Holy Spirit. To let the Holy Spirit get me. You just leave me alone. Paul says in Corinthians, he says, um, Since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Why seek for spiritual gifts? Why be zealous and earnest for spiritual gifts? Why hunger for the Holy Spirit to move in your life? I'll tell you why. Because some of the problems that you face in your own life and in the lives of others are bigger than you. The sin that people get their life, themselves into is bigger than you. The difficulties and the hurt that they suffered are bigger than you. Your human ingenuity and your human intellect, your ability to give counsel, your ability to give advice isn't big enough. And some of us are really realizing it's true that you can counsel and give advice all you want. And sometimes it just doesn't seem to be enough. You ever felt like that? You felt like you've just shared the gospel to people till you're just exhausted. You're trying to help them out of marriage dilemma or a financial dilemma or some dilemma or try to, to, to get them to stop sinning and ruining their life. And you've given them all the counsel, you know, and, and the thing just seems to be bigger than your counsel. They just can't seem to come out of it. Some of them even sincere about wanting to, but they don't seem to be able to come out of it, and you don't seem to be able to come up with any new answers to give them to help them come out of it. And you just want to run around and throw your hands up and say, I don't know what to do. I've, I've told them everything I know what to I've told them everything. And then we start looking for other people who may have a better answer, or they may be able to say it in a better way than we say it.
I hear it all the time. People call me and say, I've been talking to so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so about this and this. And I've been talking to them and talking to them and trying and talking to them and praying and talking to them and talking to them. And uh, I just want to, would you go, would you talk to them? W would you just, maybe if you would talk to them? I'm telling them, we need to be like the apostle said. I come to you with the words of the gospel and the Holy Spirit that brings full conviction. It isn't that the council's bad. It's we need the Holy Spirit to move. Galatians 3, 2 and 3 says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observ observing the law or believing what you heard? Are you so foolish that after beginning with the Spirit, you're now trying to attain your goal by human effort? You got a good word? Relationships. You got a good word? Build a local church. You got a good word? Give until you just can't give anymore and the Lord will give back to you. I'm telling you, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move amongst us, we've got real problems. There's people in this church that's got problems bigger than me. They're far bigger than me. The answers aren't good enough to get people out of depression. You can tell them all day long, you need to just pray. You need to sing. You need to rejoice. You need to do all that. And those things are good. And I'm saying you should tell them those things. But oh, sweet Jesus, how we need your Holy Spirit to come and fill them and comfort them. And we need it in this church. We need the Holy Spirit to come and fill this place. Because some of them are dealing with big problems. Some of you are fighting sin. And if the Holy Spirit don't come, you're in trouble. Now the question is, do we want him to come? Because the prophetic word that I heard this morning said, if he comes, he's going to expose the arm of the flesh. And when he does, you'll have to humble yourself and say, I believe the end of the prophetic word if I didn't hear it wrong. Kind of ended like, we need your help. We, we just need your help. We need your help in this church. Seems that in some areas, we've got lukewarm. Some areas, we're not as zealous as we used to be. We're not as bold as we used to be. Come, Holy Spirit. You ever talk to anybody in this church that's going through a difficult time? And you tried to comfort them? You tried to edify them and they're still struggling? We got to want the Holy Spirit to come. Where the Spirit is, there's liberty, there's freedom, there's hope, there's righteousness, there's peace, there's joy. I want to cry out today for the Holy Spirit to come and help us. I'm not going to be so prideful that I think I got all the answers and I don't need any help. I need some help. I need help running this church and you need help being a Christian every day. And some of you are depressed and you fight it and you need to cry out and say, Holy Spirit, come, comfort me. Comfort me. Comfort me. Come and help me. I need help. I've heard what the preacher said. I've heard what my friend said. 
I've heard the counsel. I need help. Come help her and fill me and help me. Can we stand, church? Paul to come to the piano. I'm going to ask you to do something. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking other tongues and the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart and you feel like that's something that God wants you to have, I want you to come to the front. The other thing is I, I want the people here that are struggling with sin, that have misunderstood the message of grace, I want you to cry out that the Holy Spirit come and convict you of your sin and cleanse you. And if you're hurting, if you're going through a hard time for one reason or another, you're fighting depression, I want you to begin to cry out and say, fill me, Holy Spirit. Comfort me. Help me. Anybody here is having difficulties raising their children? Having difficulties with your spouse? I want you to begin to cry out. Help me. Just help me. I need help. This thing's bigger than advice. This thing's bigger than counsel. I need the Holy Spirit to come. Can we do that? It's Paul's playing now. Let's just extend our arms towards heaven. And let's just begin to worship. Let's begin to cry out.